Hello, my name is John Popwich, and joining me today at the 2013 Banff Mountain Film and Book Festival is accomplished UK alpinist Nick Bullock. He is also the author of the book Echoes, One Climber's Hard Road to Freedom, which was shortlisted for this year's festival. Nick, it's a real pleasure to chat with you today and also to welcome you back here to the Canadian Rockies. Thanks, John. A key part of your personal landscape's been your years of working in the prison service. Yeah. Um, your book starts out with some very, um, very graphic, very fast imagery of a horrible fight in a prison. Mm -hmm, and yeah. then also, um, you look at a, a, a bad situation when you were climbing when you saw another person get struck by a falling rock. Yeah. There's some similarities and differences, and it really sort of sets the tone for, for what you've talked about a lot in your book. Right. Um, so I really like to talk to you about those, those two lives. So maybe you could tell me a bit about growing up in your childhood and the kinds of things that led you to start the work in the prison service. Oh, okay, right. Well, I, I, was, you know, I was born in the Midlands in the UK, uh, in England. And from a very working class kind of background, and um, no disrespect to my old man, but you know he was from a generation what he grew up, and he just went out to work, and he 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 got a job that paid the most, and it didn't matter whether it gave satisfaction, you know it wasn't a you know whatever, and he kind of instilled that, whether it was intentionally or not, into me, and so I was kind of growing up with this whole sort of thing you know running through my mind you know that you know you, life was about getting a job didn't matter what it was just that paid the most um, at some point you bought a house and at another point you met a woman then you got married then you had children then you got your dog and your Ford Escort and you did that till you were about 60 odd and then you retired and you died. <laughs> you, you, you actually seem to talk about getting a sense early on with that kind of life, though, that there are other prisons, right? You, you start to speak about um, owing the bank, being held hostage to those kinds of things. Um, it, it seemed that you were starting to build a space that might actually um, start to define you as, as, as seeing a real contrast with those kinds of things. Is that true? Yeah, well, it, it, it came later on in life, I think, that really, for me. When, when, when I like, moved away from home and then I started you know, following this path that I thought was was the path I was going to take. But then, I, you know, and it was probably when things didn't work out and actually life wasn't that straightforward and, and that, you know, run of the mill and, and it didn't work out. And it was then that you have to start, you know, you, 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 you sit back and you kind of go, well, actually, this isn't, <laughs> it hasn't worked it's kind of, quite how I've been led to believe it, it works. And, and so that, that kind of questioning these things and feeling a little bit beholden to the, some of the, the, the powers that be, let's say. Was it a sense of disappointment? Uh, was it a sense of disappointment? I think, yeah, maybe, I think it was a sense of probably a little bit, yeah, being, being let down a little bit, actually. Mm, life isn't quite this, this you know, straightforward. Life isn't going to be quite like that. Or maybe as well as maybe I was just getting, starting to find myself a bit more as well. And I was like starting to question these things just because that's the sort of person I am anyway. I, t I tend to question things a lot. There's, there's a strong theme of sort of individual and social responsibility and kind of questioning and having a freedom to do that. I yeah. noticed throughout, throughout your writing, um, you talked about... Uh, um, your disappointment when people had no consideration for those around them. You've, uh, you wrote that uh, you didn't have a lot of tolerance for people that, mm. that, uh, that seemed to be, uh, you know, unmoved by their effect on other people or their decisions. Yeah. Um, yeah. How did that sort of play out for you? Did that start to kind of define how you wanted to be or didn't want to I, be? I, you know, it's a good question because I, I don't really know where that, that started to happen with me, that, that kind of, I get really, really annoyed when, when people, you know, people walk over other people and, and they're not very nice to other people. And, and I don't know where that, that anger inside me comes from, really. Um, it's something that's really, really developed in me as I've got older. And I think probably, you know, working in the prison service definitely started it. Because when I started in the prison service, um, I wasn't like that. And it's only over a, ma a period of time of working in the prison service that I actually started to kind of look at the injustices and, and think, well, you know, people shouldn't be treated like that. And, and it, 
annoy me. <laughs> with, with that, that sounds like there was some good knowledge that came from working in the prison service then, and as horrific as some of the things you saw, there, there seemed to be some, some good learning that came. I think there is, but you have to remain, you have to question a lot yourself, you have to be quite introspective, you have to remain quite open-minded, um, and you have to not, what I've s spoken about in the book, I think, take the easier path which is to basically shut out everything that's, that opens yourself up and go, right, well, I'm on this side, they're on that side. They are of this kind of personality. I'm here, I'm not letting anybody, and I'm not changing that decision. If you're like that, you know, in a way, that's the easier way. But if you then open yourself up to being knocked down, and repeatedly, it's hard, it's difficult. But that's kind of what I, I ended up doing, working in the prison service, because I just wanted to give everybody a chance. You, you, you wrote on your blog recently, you, you asked the question, should we live scared or should we try and enjoy and take solace when we can? Did you feel that until you took up climbing, which we'll talk about in a moment, mm. and made that switch, that part of this work in the prison and, uh, um, and so on, you were kind of living scared in your life? Yeah, I was definitely living scared. I, I was scared of, um, I, was, I, I was scared of, of life passing by, time running out. Um, I was scared of suddenly waking up out of my bubble and being 65. Um, I was scared of not doing the things I really wanted to do since I found climbing. I was scared of not going to the places, not meeting the people. I was scared of becoming cynical and a bitter person. So uh, let's talk about discovering climbing then. How did, yeah. that, how did that happen? What did that feel like? It must have... Uh, just liberation, really. A complete... I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I, I found climbing when I trained to be a PE instructor. I was late coming to climbing about... That was 28, 29, and then I didn't start climbing properly until I was about 30. And after six months, I went to Yosemite Valley by myself. And it was the first time I've ever seen full-time climbers, climbing bums, people going and climbing for big periods of life. And I was like, wow, what is this all about? I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from this background where people, people grow up to work and to put things around them and build like this safety net around them. And here were all these people that were just free spirits, in, as far as I could tell, and, you know, living for the next climb, the next campground, and, and that, was, that was such a revelation to me. Did you, um, were you, were you driven by what you'd seen in, in, in the prison service? You, uh, service, you, you wrote that, uh, um, that maybe that the witnessing the ruin and pain helped fuel some of your, your desire and your drive and kept you going, is that? Yes, I think it definitely kept me going, get, kept, definitely fired me up to, I saw so much waste, <laughs> so much waste, and I met I met some some like quite articulate, intelligent, decent people <laughs> who were inmates, and they just they just wasted their life, and it, it was it made me feel sad. So re returning to prison work during your climbing development must have seemed to be pretty stressful then it at that was, point. I, yeah, because I, I, I was doing a lot of expeditions and a lot of trips when I still worked in the prison service. Um, and every time I returned back to the prison, it was like, whoa, I'm here again. And this other world. And I, I had a very, very distinct, you know, two worlds in my life. I had world inside a prison. Um, people, you know, who I would never meet outside. And this is like quite a weird thing. And, you know, people probably won't think about this, but I knew, I knew a load of, I had two separate lives. And people outside, my friends or climbing friends, and they just never met this group of people who I also knew and who I also spent a lot of my time with. And it was a, it was a very strange situation to be in. Well, you, you, you talked about, we talked earlier about the, uh, the, the, the opening of your book that shows a, a violent circumstance in prison, but also a violent circumstance that happens in the, in the mountains. Yeah. And, and you said that, uh, uh, that, that the mountains' honest hardships always left you being cleansed. And you, you, you speak quite often about uh, 
you know, you talk about climbing on the, on a bridge that it was honest and dependable. Yeah. You know, there, there's uh, and and that existing honestly and fully was the best way for you, yes. for you to be. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious about um, how you see the marked differences then between those two environments because both are are difficult. Uh, yeah, yeah. To to me, going to the mountains, I. I and I, and I know you could say, well, you'd, you know, you could be avalanched and stuff can go on, but it, it wasn't evil. It wasn't, it wasn't in the heart of a, a, a living being. It's an inanimate object. The mountains are inanimate. The rock is inanimate. And you got kind of out of them truth and honesty and you got out of them what you put into them. But you were never, I never, you know, I never saw it as you were going to be double crossed kind of thing. Whereas maybe, maybe it was a, you know, maybe it was a, at a point in my life and writing that kind of thing. Maybe, you know, maybe I was quite cynical. Maybe I was more cynical then than what I am now. Because it sounds quite a cynical thing when you've said that like that. I, I was also just thinking of the, the thrills because you do, you do talk about uh, that, that you, you notice that there could be some similarities between the addictions of alpinism yeah. and the addictions of repeat criminals. Yeah. And you even use the term crime or climb That's at right. one point. Maybe tell me a little bit more about, about that feeling or what that was like. Well, I, you know, you're a climber. You know what you get out of climbing, the kind of enjoyment and the, the thrill and, and what I've, I've, I've always, and I, I haven't thought about it for a while, but I've always been under the opinion that, that we are animals and uh, you know, at one time we were meant to go around and fight dinosaurs, and now we just go down to the supermarket and find the food, and it makes us all a little bit kind of stale, I think. Yeah. And there's still a lot of people, I think in probably everybody, but a lot of people kind of maybe don't think about it too much, but then there are people who, like me, and like you, and like a lot of other people who, you know, you need to, you still have not like a, an inkling to go back to that time because you need to challenge yourself and and I think criminals are probably a lot of them so you know no it, 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 it's a lot deeper thing than that obviously it's to do with the situation where they grew up and their background sure. and, and everything and but it's also for some of them for sure it's the excitement it's the buzz. So you're living these two lives and then it comes to be a point where you, like some of the prisoners that you're taking care of, have a dream of escape. Right? Yeah. And, and so maybe tell me about that. How did, how did that emerge and when did it reach a kind of a crux point for you? What did that, what did that look like? Okay, it, um, when I, I, I took a six month sabbatical from the, I kind of fought for this sabbatical and I eventually got it and I thought, right. So I was away for, well, I was away for seven months actually. And, um, I basically came back from that, having been seven months away from the prison service, and I just thought, I've got to do that. You know, this is, I can, I've just spent seven months away and I love every moment of it. And I, and I went back to the prison and I was just, I was, it was horrific to be back inside. And, and I was just like, I've got to escape from this. And so I, then I think, and that was, I'm trying to think when that was, that was at around 1999. And um, I just came back from that and I just thought, got to get out of here and I did I, I really tried but I don't know if you want to get into all the boring facts but my house was in what, what's that what's that posh word that you use when it doesn't when you you bought it at the price but it's worth less than you bought it for what's that called depreciation uh, I suppose yeah it was it, it wasn't worth what it was what I bought it for e lost and equity in it. equity yeah. it was it was yeah it was a light in. and and I, I put it on I still put it on the market and I was just going to sell it and I'd all been paying the mortgage on it for a long time. I, I had no, no real savings at the time and I just desperately wanted to get out. But I couldn't sell it because I could only get offered even like less than what I'd paid for it and I wasn't gonna do that. So I just couldn't sell it and I felt trapped, mm -hmm. for, very trapped for, for a period. And then I just went, right, I'm just gonna buckle down, I'm gonna earn as much money as I can. And, and so then I fully focused on a, peer, a, a time where it, I knew I would then be able to pay my mortgage off and escape. And, and still, um, with some of the things that you experienced in the mountains, and you talk about being in Peru and helping search for the loss mm. of a couple of, of Austrian climbers mm. and, and realizing at that moment that, that climbing had an impact, you still say that you felt safer 
in the mountains than you ever did in those other circumstances. Yeah, I just, I just felt more. I just, I just felt at home. It's a cliche, I'm sorry. But I just felt more relaxed. I felt at ease. I felt safer. I felt less intimidated in the mountains than I did in inner cities and in a prison. Because you, you just couldn't forecast what could quite happen next. One, one aspect that I wanted to talk to you about is the birth of your writing, because in, in a way the, the book also speaks to that. It's your work in the prison, your mm. emergence as an alpinist, but then also finding your voice as, as a writer. Um, maybe tell me about that, the, the, the process for you of writing and what it's, what it's been like and any similarities between that and your climbing. Yeah, I, I, I didn't start writing until about 2000. And I was sort of bullied by my friend, who's a full-time writer, into, into writing. And I still was kind of kicking against it. And I, I just climbed the Drew Couloir um, in Chamonix, above Chamonix. And I came back down from that and I still hadn't written anything. And I suddenly got the urge and, and I sat in my, my van in the, in the campsite, you know, the Sloping Field campsite. And I sat there and I just, I, I, you know, pulled all of my stuff, big envelopes and, and I just like got as much paper as I could together and I just started boshing down all these words and, and then just presented it with my friend and he kind of went to work and sort of showed me the light and what, you know, how it could be improved and stuff. And that, so that's how I, I started. And I just found it really cathartic. I found it gave me such a, a sense of, you know, of, of like opening up and going, wow, you know, this is great. Because um, at the time as well, I was also a very, very private person. The prison service and working in the prison had made me very private and very kind of closed shop. I didn't, you know, I, I found trusting people very difficult. Mm -hmm. Just because cause of, I'd worked so long with people you couldn't particularly trust. And it, it just, it spreads, you know, into who you are. That, you, you, you know, I couldn't fully change that. And, and I found with my writing, the big thing it really, really did, once I, I, I got into it more, was it just opened me up as a person and it kind of, it helped me, it really helped me to open up and to explore things going on in my own mind. Well, there's actually, there's a strong ethical component I find to your, to your writing. Um, did all the sort of the gray areas that you worked in and discerning right and wrong and, and values and so on throughout your career and even, even asking some of the questions you found as an, as an alpinist, did that have an impact on, on the way you write at all, do you think? Um, good question again. I haven't really I haven't thought that much about it, but I, I suppose what you're getting at is a lot of people say that I write very honestly, um, and, which I presume is what you But there's mean areas by. of grey in what you write about, right? It, it, your, your, your writing has a quality of, of discerning right and wrong, yet in, an er, in areas that there's often grey, so kind people in prison. Okay. Uh, or, or um, well, is that not being truthful for, and honest? It, yeah, absolutely, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, how, how has that maybe informed your climbing ethics then? Your honesty uh, about your writing and, and your your views on life as a, as a climber, particularly, how has that influenced your ethics as a climber? I, I I don't know if it's influenced my ethics as a climber. I think it's probably just who I am, I, and I just I try to be as honest a person in every aspect of my life as I can be. And get, don't, like, don't, don't, I'm no, I'm no saint. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we all make mistakes, but I just, I just try to be as honest. That is who I am. And so I think I probably took that honesty. I had that, I think, before, and I took that into my climbing and I took it into my writing. I think that, you know, I, I, I really think that's the person I was. So what kinds of uh, features define what you think have been your greatest, your greatest moments in, in climbing or in other areas of your life? Okay, well, in Besides a way... honesty. <laughs> yeah, well, the, 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 the easiest, easiest way to answer that question is, is walking out of a prison, walking out of a job that um, was destroying me inside. It was affecting me mentally. Um, and but it was also securing the rest of my life. It was making my life in a way comfortable because I could afford things every month. A paycheck would come in, and so the, for me, you know, 
the greatest thing that I've done in my life is to write that resignation and to walk out of that door that last time. You can take away all the climbing. Yeah. So, so now that you've embraced that new life and you're free from the, the prison of prison, yeah. as, a, as it were, and all those things, you still have acknowledged that there's no ultimate freedom. How do you find security now in that balance? Because it's difficult. It, it's really difficult. We always trade things. So you've, Yeah, unless, unless you're very, very lucky and fortunate in life, I think you have. Life's a, life's a compromise, isn't it? And, and I've, I've, you know, I've made big sacrifices really in, in another way, but to me they were worth making and taking for the last 10 years of my life. It was a big risk at the time, and, but I've, I've, you know, I've lived, I, I have no fixed abode. And for the first four or five years, you know, I was living, living on just the rent of my house because my house, I paid my house mortgage off on my house and that's rented out. And I don't get that much from it. It just about is enough to pay for food in a month. And I had some savings left from working in the prison. And I was just, right, well, I'm just going and doing this. And that's what I did for the first four or five years. But then, fortunately, I got a bit of money from sponsorship, and then writing a few lectures. And so it just, just all... And when you haven't got a, a fixed place and you're not paying a mortgage or rent, it's, just, it's surprising how cheaply you can live. True. Um, but kind of, you know... 10 years down the line, it's kind of, I wouldn't mind somewhere I could leave some of my stuff now. <laughs> Do you think it's an accurate statement uh, that you, you, you kind of seem to be in a quest for a better relationship with all things, you know, with yourself, with climbing, with people? Do you think that's, yeah, that's, that's true? I think that's completely true. It's quite a good, good, good kind of, well done, John, I like that. <laughs> I know, yeah, I, I think it is, you know, in, it's really, really difficult, and it's taken me a long, long time to get to the point in life where I can really, really try to kind of give people time and to be open-minded and, and, and try and look at people and to try my hardest to understand where they're coming from and their decisions. What's the best you've seen in people and the worst you've seen in people then? The best I've seen in people. Well, the worst I've seen in people, I, I, I suppose that's the easy one. Um, I saw some pretty bad things in a prison. Uh, definitely that thing that my book opens with, with like seeing, well, I didn't actually see it, but a guy getting hit over the head, bludgeoned twice with an iron bar, virtually killed lay in a pool of blood on the floor and I kind of had to deal with that. And the thing about that was, is the guy was a paedophile and there's a lot of people out there who would say, well, he deserved everything he got. But he didn't deserve that. He'd been put in prison, he'd been found guilty and that's what the courts had given him. That's what he, it wasn't for. And the guy who, who hit him, he did it for a £20 crack deal. <laughs> now, he isn't, he isn't the guy that should be dishing out justice. <laughs> what about the best then? I, I think the best, things in life, the best things I've seen in life are people who are, they're totally unselfish. They seem to spend their lives working with the homeless, with the, the mentally disabled, you know, ill people and they, they seem to just dedicate their lives and give their lives to help that kind of person. People, you know, with problems and, and to me that's just, you know, I'm selfish. I could just never see me do myself, maybe, I hope I can actually, I hope in another however many years down the line, I hope I really can because to do, you know, those sides and to be so unselfish, to help people out there, you know, try and alleviate poverty and, and help people who are really having a difficult time in life, that to me is, is just, just so, you know, just... So what's next for you then? What's next for me? Um, write another book. Um, climb, you know, I, I still... I was just looking at the internet and a few of my friends have been doing routes and I get this little bit of FOMO, you know, do, do you know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. 
<laughs> and I still I remember that. So yeah, I still suffer a little bit with that, although it's it's calmed a lot. Um definitely want to go and still climb a bunch of routes and go to the greater ranges and climb stuff. I'm you know, uh what's next for me? Um recently in a like I'm in a a new relationship and that for me is quite because I've had big periods in my life that I haven't I've been on my own and that's that's it's exciting it's challenging um, it won't stop me kind of doing the things I'm doing but it's 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 you know it's great um, yeah just kind of I, I, I would like to probably look to get a fixed base <laughs> Um, because ten years, you know, ten years is a long time to be living out of bags and in the back of a van and huts. And it'll be on your own terms, though. It that's, that's, will be on my own terms, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and it'll be in a place where I'm close to climbing in the mountains. What's the riskiest thing you've ever done? The riskiest thing I've ever done: um, writing out my resignation for the prison service. Is <laughs> the riskiest thing I've ever done. What's the biggest peak you've ever climbed? The biggest peak I've actually climbed, I think, would be Chang Himal in Nepal, which was 6,800 metres. How close to the edge do you like to get? <laughs> How close to the edge? Well, reasonably close, I suppose, you know. It's a good view from the edge, isn't it? <laughs> what do you fear the most? Getting old. You find a hut in the woods with a blank logbook. What message do you leave? Uh, haha, beat you to it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, thanks very much for taking the time to speak with us. Today. No, no worries, Sean. Thank you. Cheers, mate.